on all the people who made our freedom possible. I'm sure you have heard before that freedom does not come free, and that is very, very true. So, just, uh, I'm actually, I think it would be important to stop and give some reflection on Memorial Day. So I'm just gonna give us like a 30 second moment of silence. So if you would join with me, uh, I understand kids are still up here, so it's not gonna be perfectly quiet, but if you just join me in a moment of silence. Thank you for that. Um, and I, I think what Murph and Bobby said was perfect for this time. And so I'm just gonna leave it at that. Um, so a couple announcements. My father's house is on spirit, uh, summer. And I think, man, we're, we're in the perfect place right now for uh, be it responding to tragedy. I think as we, as people respond to tragedy, it is important to come to church. Stuff like 9-11, that happened. Um, and I was going back and forth, like, I think it's super important for me as the pastor of this church to give a spiritual response to this shooting. I, I wanna be clear, I'm not trying to be political. That's not my goal. I have no initiative to be political up here. Politics has its place, and I think we should all be politically engaged as Christians, but I think I want to focus more on what we can do personally over what we can do politically. And I would say what you do personally, how you respond personally, matters more than how you respond politically, personally. So the first thing, I, I have three points here, like any good preacher would. Uh, the first one is reflect and pray. So you might see a bunch of things on Facebook about, I say my thoughts and prayers are for this or that, and people are kind of getting tired of that. Well, I'm not getting tired of that. I think uh, we should always be responding with reflection and prayer. No matter your ideological perspective, your ideas of right or wrong, being reflective and praying for those people is important because it allows you to be open to what God is trying to tell us. So being open to God is never a bad thing. So reflection and prayer. The second thing is to mourn and weep. To mourn and weep. And so uh, you might say, what is me mourning and weeping going to do for the people who uh, were affected by the school shooting? And I will say nothing. Mourning and weeping, us personally, will do nothing for them. But how you respond to tragedy is important for your soul. And so when something tragic like this happens, I encourage all of us to mourn and weep in this situation. And the third point is love and compassion to everybody. Love and compassion to everyone. I think that love and compassion will do more than posting on Facebook, fighting with your Uncle Joe, because Jesus teaches that love and compassion is the most important thing. I'm not saying that these other things aren't important. I'm just trying to put first things first. So um, if you guys, if we could pray for the families there right now, I think that that would be very helpful. So if you would join me in prayer. Lord, we see such evil in this world. And what happened uh, on Tuesday was pure evil, Lord. And we lift that up to you. We pray that you would be working in the lives of the people affected, that you would be with them as they comfort them and help us to have love and compassion towards others. Help us to keep this in our thoughts and prayers. And Lord, we just love you and we mourn in this situation. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. And then just a couple new announcements. We have announcements on there, but there's just two more. Bridget's father, um, her father's cancer has metastasized and has moved to his spine and he's dealing with a lot of pain. So if you could keep her father in your prayers. What's his name? I'm sorry. Kevin, if you could just keep Kevin. David. David. Why? Why? David, uh, if you could keep David in your prayers. Also, Mike Bowers, who sometimes sits in the back, uh, Richie's friend, his grandfather died this morning, so if you could keep his family in your prayers as well. So we'll pray for those as well. If uh, the ushers want to come up, we will lift this all up in prayer. Part six of our sermon series, The Light of David. And we have one more week of this, so we're going to close up next week. Last week I talked about David living in adultery, and uh, that's an important thing. This week I'm going to be talking about blessing and curses, but I wanted to close up this sermon series on just an overview of the life of David. And then in two weeks, a guest speaker will be coming. It is one of my fellow classmates that I go to school with, and uh, he is going to be sharing a fantastic word with us today. I will be here, but he will be joining us. But today, I want to be talking about blessings and curses. And maybe you've heard these terms before, and you think that they're religious, right? Blessings, you might think about praying before food, or you might be thinking about saying God bless you to somebody after they sneeze. Or you might think of the Beatitudes, right? Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the pure in heart. We easily think of these terms as religious terms, blessing. Or you might hear the term curses. You might say, oh, that's a bad religion or bad things. Witches or Harry Potter that blessings are good things and curses are bad things. But these are both religious terms. And they are both essential to the biblical story. So, blessings and curses are essential to the biblical story. And we have to know what these terms mean and understand how they apply to our lives. Now, first and second Samuel, which is where we get the story of David, is trying to give us a picture of blessings and curses. We look at the life of Samuel and Saul, especially Saul, where there was blessing in his life at first, but then he fell away from God and curses began to fall on his life. And David had blessings in his life, but we are in 2 Samuel and we see that there are many curses that come out of living in sexual adultery. And then we will see that in 1 and 2 Kings where Israel will fall away from God and will receive curses. So what is a blessing and what is a curse? Well, I have some definitions of blessings and curses, and um, I just want to explain them to you. Blessing is when God shares his life-producing ability to others. So this might be having children, but it's also producing life like gardening, like taking care of animals when God shares his life-producing ability with others. And a curse is when we try to produce blessing separate from God. And so, if uh, there's, I've advertised this before, but there's this great YouTube video series called The Bible Project. And I got these definitions out of their YouTube video on blessings and curses. I encourage you to watch that. But there is not necessarily many things that are mythical about blessings or curses. It's not some over-spiritualized thing, but it has to do with both spiritual aspects, but also our day-to-day -day lives. I love this picture of the blessing on one side where it's 
fruitful and green, and then on the other side of the tree, the curse is very desolate. And this is the picture of blessings and curses that we get. It's a biblical principle. True life comes from blessings from God. But an illusion of true life is what curses are. Because we believe that we can reach the blessings apart from God. And that's not true. And we see this from the beginning, right? The, um, Satan deceiving Adam and Eve. Did God really say that? Is that true? If you eat of the, uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. Trying to receive blessing apart from God always turns into a curse. Before the fall, Adam and Eve had food and dominion over the earth and fruitfulness. But after eating the apple or the fruit from the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they fell. We are always trying to take a shortcut away from God's blessing to receive blessing on our own. If I can get blessed aside from God, I no longer need God. But like I said before, it's just an illusion. It's not true blessing. Sin is always a curse. No matter what it is, it is always a curse, even though it seems like a blessing. And this curse extends far beyond what we ever imagined. Sin is always expanding so far. And this is what David's story teaches us. It teaches us to beware of curses and to look for God's blessing, not blessing apart from God. Today we're going to be talking about 2 Samuel 13 through 19. But I'm going to be going just like talking about it and only reading a few passages from it. I encourage you guys to read it on your own. To know what I am saying is true, to evaluate it for yourself, because we will be jumping around. But basically, 2 Samuel 13 through 19, what we see is that there is a rape in which one of David's sons rapes his sister Tamar. Amnon rapes his sister Tamar. And then Absalom, who is a the full brother of Tamar, kills Amnon. And then Absalom grabs for power from his father, David. We will also kind of allude to Solomon, who is one of David's sons, who be, actually becomes king after David. But when it comes to blessings and curses, I have three points. And the first one is that our sin spreads wide through curses. And so, if you look at this, there's kind of a center part of this picture, and it spreads out. This is a picture of a network, or bacteria spreading. And it can many times be uncontrolled, the connections that are made. Our sin spreads wide through curses. We think that our sin only affects us. I many times will say, oh... If I do this, it's only going to affect me. But we forget how far sin goes. We forget how far sin goes. I'm going to give you a simple example. Lying. Many of us think that lying is a harmless lie. It's not that big of a deal. It's not going to hurt anybody if I tell a lie, especially if it is about me. But one thing we see today is the effects of constant lying. The corrosion of truth. How many people in the past year have heard about false information, right? That there's all this false information and we don't know what's true and what's not true. Because we see that leaders are constantly lying. The simple thing of lying has turned to a destruction of our country because we don't know who to trust. This has happened with many people who say the world is flat, right? So we'll, 
Many people, most people in the world believe that the world is round. But there are people out there that believe that the world is flat. And we might say, this is a conspiracy theory, right? The world is flat. It's a conspiracy theory. But it's a it's something that people believe because the people in power have lied for so much, for so long. That lying, it's a simple thing of lying, has turned into a de degradation of society. All by a simple lie that is then not considered to be sin. This is what happens when we consider sin not sin. It degrades the society around us. The sin can be simple, but it will always have massive consequences. I have learned this in my own life, that my past sins have affected me today. When I was in high school, people to do drugs and drink alcohol, this is uh, something I'm very not proud of, but I began to peer pressure people. And I remember when I was a senior, I peer pressured some freshmen into doing drugs and alcohol. And then I became a Christian my senior year of high school, and I left all that behind, and I forgot about those people who I peer pressured into. And many years later, I came back home, and I found out that one of my cousins was doing heroin. And I was shocked, and I asked how he ended up getting into heroin, and wouldn't you know it, it was the two people that I peer pressured when I was a senior in high school. Our sins have effect. They go far. It spreads far. We see this with family curses, right? That children who are born out of wedlock are statistically more likely to have children born out of wedlock themselves. That uh, depression and anxiety are passed down from generation to generation. Alcoholism, something that is very near and dear to my heart, gets passed on from generation to generation. And a pride that doesn't allow God to work in people's lives. Passed down from generation to generation. We all have family curses. And David had this too in his family. We see spiritual and moral compromise of David coveting and covering up adultery and murder. What we find out later is that Solomon worships many gods and Solomon's son, Rehoboam, rejects wise counsel. It's a thing that is passed down from generation to generation. Unresolved conflict is something we see throughout the Bible. That if the parents have unresolved conflict with their siblings, their children will most likely have unresolved conflict. And this is true in David's life. And sexual sin. David does not resist his lust, but engages in it as many wives and concubines. And his children have a similar problem. This should cause us pause, right? That we, what we do, our sin, will have an effect on our children. And that's a scary thing to think of. So in 2 Samuel 13, 1 through 2, and then 13, 10 through 17, here's the story of Amnon falling in love with his sister Tamar, and then raping her. So 2 Samuel 13, 1 through 2 says, In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister Tamar that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. 2 Samuel 13, 10 through 17 says, Then Amnon said to Tamar, this is jumping ahead in the story a little bit, but she comes to him, and he says to her, Bring the food here into my bed so that I may eat from your hand. 
And Tamar took the bread she had prepared and brought it to her brother Amnon in his bedroom. But when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, Come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of my disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep you from being married, or not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out. No, she said to him, Sending me away would be greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, Get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. I spoke about this last week, but uncontrolled lust always runs amok. And the pattern set forth for children will be a pattern that is followed. Amnon saw this rule of not raping somebody as something, an obstacle to overcome, when really it was an important guideline that he needed to follow. And as we read in this story, he thinks that his satisfaction is going, is all he needs. I just need to relieve myself of this satisfaction, and then I will be satisfied. But instead, he feels worse. He hated her more than he loved her. Festering sin, we think that it is what it is, we just need to indulge ourselves. But it truly spread, spread so far. And people begin to be affected by our sins. Many people are hurt. Many people are harmed, even though we think this is only affecting me. Curses and sins are just from the wrong source. It's getting trying to get blessing from the wrong source. Away from God. But we must always be checking our actions and saying, is this from God? So the first point is, our sins spread wide through the curse. They affect other people, our children, our friends, people we may not even know. And that is why it's so important to make sure that we are protecting ourselves and others from sin. But our sins also run deep through the curse. Sins change us in deep ways that can be awfully terrible. This week I was uh, helping my wife in gardening. I was digging up an area so that she could put topsoil down and plant uh, a garden there. And there were many bushes that used to be in this garden, and I had to keep on digging deeper and deeper to get rid of these roots that were already there. And as you can see here, I love, I love this picture because you can see just how deep the roots of this tree are. The deeper the roots, the harder it is to uproot. If you've ever done gardening, you realize this, but this is also true in our lives with sin. What we think is good can many times be really bad for us and dig down deep bitterness and uh, uncontrolled sin. Well, Tamar had a brother and he was her full brother. And like any good brother, Absalom was protective over Tamar. And so when we read this story, we see some good things about Absalom. He is portrayed as a villain, but protection over a sister is such a great thing. But what is not a good thing is revenge. Being controlled by revenge. And so 
Absalom seeks revenge over Amnon. And he is controlled by revenge. And many of us might say, we might cheer him on. Or we might feel attempting to cheer him on. Your sister is raped. Of course you should get revenge. But Jesus tells us to seek out a different way. To avoid revenge. Now, I, I'm going to be honest. I mean, if I'm standing up here, if something were to happen to my children or my wife or one of my sisters, I'm not going to stand up here and act like I wouldn't want revenge or wouldn't even seek revenge. But I know what Jesus offers, and what he offers is that we should not seek revenge. We should certainly protect people. We should be protecting our children and our spouses and the people who are weaker than us. And what Amnon did was terrible, but Jesus teaches against revenge. And it may be a part that we don't like, but it is something that we should be, pay attention to. Because when we seek out revenge, we are ruled by that revenge. And we see this in Absalom. That being ruled by revenge slowly destroys our heart. So Absalom kills Amnon, but it wasn't enough for him. After he kills Amnon, he tries to control the kingdom, take the kingdom away from his father. Because while we think that these sins are little, and obviously murder is not little, but we, in our own lives we might think, well, if I just do this small thing, it won't have any effect on me. If I am having extramarital affairs, who cares if I lie? Who cares if I accidentally use the Lord's name in vain? But the sin runs deep to uproot. I think Satan many times helps us look at sin and say, ooh, it's kind of like a fire. And if I just get close to it, might be warmed by the heat of this fire. It may comfort us, and then all of a sudden we are burnt by our own sin. And then we say, oh, well, it won't do that again. But many times our sin is just a good thing twisted into a bad thing. And again, it's just blessing outside of God. So I've talked a lot about sin. Many of you are probably sitting there thinking, wow, I feel really encouraged today. Thank you, Pastor Shane, for bringing a, such an encouraging sermon about sin. Where is the hope, right? That might, that's what I would be asking if I was sitting in your seat. If our sin runs wide and runs deep, what hope do we have? Well, I'm just going to read Ephesians 3. 16 through 21 that says this I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how deep and how high is the love of Christ. And to know that love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So curses go far, but blessing always goes further. Curses go far, but blessings always go further. And as you can see here, the cross's shadow extends past anything that we can imagine throughout the whole world. See, <clears throat> the thing is that idolatry many times leads 
to sin and then to a curse. And in Exodus 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are, 4 through 6, we get the third commandment that teaches us that yes, curses go far, but blessing always goes further. Exodus 20, 4 through 6. You shall not make for you an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And this is where it's important. Punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations those who love me and keep my command. So we see how far curses go that they pass along in a generation to generation. Three to four generations. But look at the blessing in this passage. To a thousand generations. The blessing will always go further than the curse. And the only way to undo curses is by being, by doing, by performing blessings. It's one of the reasons why I give a benediction every single week. Because I believe that blessings have power. By speaking over a blessing, it creates power. Again, blessing is sharing, but God sharing his life-producing ability to others. And death never brings life. Only life can bring life. So by un how we undo curses is by living in the blessings of God and spreading that blessing to others. You don't stop sinning by focusing on the sin. You stop sinning by focusing on Jesus. By focusing on the giver of life. And David never loses his blessing. Let me repeat that again. David sins, but he never loses his blessing. But he has to deal with the curses in this world. But his blessing was that the Messiah would come out of him. We need to be seeking the blessings of the promises of our life. And it's easy to look around and say the curse has run far and wide. But by just looking at it, we're not fixing it. We need to be seeking the blessing. And it starts with us. Uh, I think it's appropriate this morning, I asked Murph to sing um, Amazing Grace. And it's one of my favorite songs, Amazing Grace. It's one of our country's favorite songs. Even in secular places, we sing it. But that song is a perfect image of how a curse becomes a blessing. John Newton, who wrote that song, was in the Royal Navy for Britain. And then afterwards, like many other people who were in the Royal Navy, became a slave trader. And one night, off the coast of Ireland, he gets caught up in a storm. And like many people who have been caught up in storms, they pray to God, if you just get me out of this, I will follow you. And what ended up happening was John Newton stopped being a slave trader and became an advocate for abolition to end the slave trade. And one of his disciples, uh, William Wilberforce, led legislation to end the slave trade in Britain turning a curse into a blessing. So if you guys would stand with me, if somebody would uh, go out and thank you, DJ, to leave Murph, you just stand with me and pray. I think it's just good for us to re-look at blessings and curses. And, and just be praying to God and asking God, hey, what can I sure turn from a curse to a blessing? Because that's the point of being a Christian. It's to turn a curse from a curse.
to a blessing, to bless others. So if you would join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness and your fullness and your riches of life. I pray that we would embrace the richness of you, move away from sin and the curse that comes from sin, and focus on you, the giver of life. In Jesus' name, amen.